welcome whiteboard doctors. Uh, for those who are new to the channel, welcome for the first time. We're a free open access medical education channel, um, trying to bring educational content to you so we can learn with and from you. Um, for those who are returning, welcome back. Um, if you're interested in what you're seeing, check out some other videos. Feel free to su subscribe. Um, please leave some comments in terms of questions, clarifications, or any other content you'd like us to make videos on. Uh, today we'll be doing a procedural video on lumbar punctures. Um, so this is a very common procedure in the emergency department as well as on the general floors and in the intensive care units. Um, there are many, many indications for it. Um, before I dive into indications, contraindications, complications, and all that, I first want to talk about the procedure and the anatomy of the procedure. Um, so to the left here, I drew out um, the anatomy that's important to be aware of, and we'll do some labels here. So um, when doing a lumbar puncture, um, you're puncturing through the back of the patient um, into the canal to get a sample of cerebral spinal fluid. So what are you going through? So this first green level is going to be the skin, right? So you're going to prep the skin sterilely. Um, you're going to numb the skin. Um, next level is going to be sub Q, which are all these fat bubbles. And then you're going to get to muscle. Obviously within the sub Q, there's lots of nerves and such, which is why uh, a healthy dose of lidocaine to numb that area is going to be valuable. Um, here we have both vertebral uh, transverse processes, so transverse processes, plus the intraspinous ligament, which is here. This is the intraspinous ligament. When you are going through the interspinous ligament, especially in older patients, you can sometimes get some calcifications. It can actually feel very firm, um, but that is usually the ligament. If it's firm and it lets you kind of keep pushing, um, that means you're in that ligament rather than having hit the transverse process in general. Um, after the interspinous ligament, I will put it up here. Um, this is the ligamentum flavum. So I'm just going to do LF, and this is what they kind of say gives you the characteristic pop. Um, you'll be pushing through the skin, the sub-Q, the muscle without any resistance. You'll hit the interspinous ligament. Um, in older patients, you might feel a little resistance, but it'll let you keep pushing through it, and then you'll hit the ligamentum flavum. Once you get through that, you kind of feel that characteristic pop. After the lig ligamentum flavum, um, you get into the actual epidural space. So this is the epidural space here. That's an E. Um, then this next is going to be the dura mater and arachnoid mare, so we'll do dura mater. And then after that, we'll come back down. This is the arachnoid space, and this is where you're getting your cerebral spinal fluid from. So what is all this stuff? Um, we've named the transverse processes. We can name these as well. Um, so this is going to be L2, L3, L4, L5. Um, at about L1, L2, you get this structure here. This is the conus medullaris. It's a cone at the end of the spinal cord, where after that, you get the cauda equina. Cauda equina are essentially um, long nerves that kind of filament down. They're not in a firm cord. Um, when we do lumbar punctures, uh, we aim to be in the arachnoid space that has the cauda equina. The reason being, when you poke a needle, um, you are at less risk of hitting the actual spinal nerves, right? The spinal cord is a firm structure. If you poke in um, above the cauda equina, you risk hitting the actual spinal cord, whereas the cauda equina, being these filamentous nerves, um, you don't often hit or puncture them. Um, so our goal when we're doing the uh, lumbar puncture is to find, you know, this L3, L4 space, and we'll get into how to do that. But um, just for anatomical sense, this is the cauda equina. Um, then after that, you actually have your vertebral bodies, right? Your discs here. Um, so now the procedure itself. Let's do it in. We'll stick with black. Um, so the procedure itself. What are our steps? Now that we understand the anatomy. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be first positioning. When positioning the patient, there's two different ways you can position them. First is actually sitting upright. Um, you can have them upright bending forward um, to make the anatomy more in your face. If you have the patient upright, one thing to note is that um, you can't check 
uh, pressures. You can't check their um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid pressures because gravity is playing a role. Um, the other way you can position them is actually left lateral decubitus. So left lateral decubitus versus upright. And if they're left lateral decubitus, that is the position you'd want them in to check their uh, pressures um, because gravity is not going to be playing a role. So you position them. Um, next thing is going to be kind of palpating, so finding your anatomy and finding your space. So when we palpate, the reason we're palpating is because we want to be in that L3, L4 space. Um, your anatomical markers are going to be the superior iliac crest. So what you want to do is palpate the superior iliac crest. Those are the hip bones, you know, on the back. Um, you're going to palpate them, and then you're going to follow those midline. That should be about your L3, L4 space. So palpate those superior iliac crests, move with your thumbs midline, and then palpate um, you know, slightly higher, slightly lower um, to find your two um, uh, spinous processes. When you find those, in between those should be your L3, L4 space. You can mark that um, with a sterile marker or you can just use a little syringe. What I tend to do is I'll put a syringe on the back and I'll pull the plunger a couple times, um, and that'll suction the skin and leave a little mark there. Um, you can, you know, keep the syringe and plunger with you if the mark starts to fade to to reset that mark. Next thing, as with any sterile procedure, is you're going to clean the area and get on your sterile gown and wear. All right. After you do that, you're going to be all sterile. Your kit's going to be open. Um, within most kits, there's lidocaine. Uh, so here I say lidocaine and numb it up. So you've now sterile, you're in your sterile gown and kit, you'll take lidocaine, um, you'll make your wheel at the surface, and then after that, um, you can go into the skin and actually numb the track that you're planning on going into. Obviously, be very careful, you do not want to numb into the uh, uh, arachnoid space in general. Um, so, you know, be on your syringe, be pulling back, go in a little bit, numb that track without going too deep. Next thing you're going to do, is get your needle out and perform the procedure. The one thing I wanted to uh, note is that your needle bevel, you want it to be in line with or longitudinal to the fibers. So if your patient is left lateral decubitus, so they're laying on their left side, these fibers are going to be parallel to the floor. So you want your bevel parallel to them as well. And that way you're doing the least amount of damage. If your patient is sitting upright, those uh, longitudinal fibers are going to be perpendicular to the floor. So then you want your bevel perpendicular to the floor as well. You know, so it's going to part those longitudinal fibers. Okay, so then the procedure. So we talked about our anatomy, right? What you're going to do, you palpated the superior iliac crest. You followed your thumbs midline to find your spot. You marked it, right? with a syringe, then you form your skin wheel with the lidocaine, numb a little bit of this track, and then, let me get a different color here, let's use orange. And then you're going to go in with your needle, bevel, you know, parallel to these fibers. All right, so you're gonna go in with your needle, and when you hit this area, you're gonna feel, especially in adults, a little slow down, but it's gonna let you keep pushing which is good, okay? If it doesn't let you keep pushing, it means you may have hit bone, in which case you should pull back a little and make really small movements, either up or down, until you hit this space again. You know what I mean? So let's say you hit the bone here. You're gonna make little small movements, bone again, and then all of a sudden you'll get through and you'll be able to push when you're doing those pull back and slight redirects. Then you will get, you know, you're going through your um, interspinous ligaments, you're going to be slowed down, then you're going to hit the ligamentum flavum, and once you push through it, you're going to hear that pop. All right. Once you get to that pop, you want to stop the needle, and you want to pull out. Um, each of these needles has like a, let's do a different color here. So we'll do yellow. It has like a stopper with the needle. It goes through the actual opening within the needle. You're going to pull that stopper back, which is going to open up the needle, and you're going to wait for a second to see if any CSF starts dripping out. And that's a terrible arrow. That's supposed to be an arrow. So you'll pull back this stopper, and you'll wait a second. If you don't get any CSF dripping out of the needle, you'll push the stopper back in, 
and then you will advance this needle further. All right, so a little further right, because right now you might just be in the epidural space. What you're trying to get to is here. So then you'll push the needle further, and again, you'll pull this, let me just trace that all the way down for completion's sake. You'll pull this stopper out again, you'll wait a second, and what you want to see is you want to see drips of CSF coming out of here. That's when you know you're in the right spot. Um, after that, if you want to check pressures, you can attach the pressure gauge. If you don't, you can just collect your sample. Obviously, collect all the tubes that you need, collect a spare tube that they can freeze down, and then when you're done, you'll put this stopper back in, and then you'll pull out the entire needle. Okay? So that's the anatomy of the procedure and the steps itself. Um, oftentimes, you'll have patients lay flat for a bit um, to try to prevent the development of a uh, post-lumbar puncture headache. Um, we can talk about uh, complications to um, indications and contraindications. So um, I'm going to erase this portion here to clear some room. All right. So that is the procedure itself. Um, now let's talk about indications. So when do you do a lumbar puncture? Um, there's many indications actually um, to think about here. Uh, we'll talk about kind of the most common ones. So lumbar punctures are primarily diagnostic, but they can be therapeutic, right? So diagnostic modalities for lumbar punctures are patients that you're worried about infection, right? So meningitis, encephalitis, all that. Um, patients who you're worried about a subarachnoid hemorrhage who have negative CT imaging but they're out of the greater than four hour window. Um, now there's more recent recommendations that say a CT um, A of the head uh, is sufficient but the typical teaching is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, that thunderclap headache that comes on um, that has a negative CT head. CT heads are not 100% sensitive especially if it came on more than four hours ago at which point you'll need to do a lumbar puncture to look for blood and xanthochromia. Um, and then another thing is patients with persistent altered mental status of indeterminate etiology, right? There's some autoimmune encephalitis that can come on. So uh, infection in the central nervous system, subarachnoid hemorrhage with negative CT head uh, greater than four hours out, and persistent altered mental status of indeterminate etiology. Um, also therapeutic, um, one of the main therapeutic ones that you think about, oh, that should be an R, therapeutic, is for patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It used to be called pseudotumor cerebri. These are patients with high uh, opening pressures that need uh, therapeutic taps, uh, taking off that CSF until their closing pressure is normal to decrease the pressure in their head. So that's the primary therapeutic indication. Okay, so what are contraindications now? We know our indications. We have this patient, you know, that has a fever, uh, confusion, neck stiffness that we're worried about meningitis, or we have a patient who came in with a thunderclap headache that started six hours ago. It's the worst headache of their life, and they have a negative CT head, um, but it's out of that four-hour window. Or we have a patient who is persistently altered indeterminate etiology, and we want to see if they maybe have an autoimmune encephalitis. But what are contraindications? So the one of the bigger ones that you think about is increased intracranial pressure. This is somewhat of a hypothetical contraindication. The thought is that with increased intracranial pressure, if you decrease the pressure gradient, you know, at the end of their spinal cord, you risk the patient having a herniation higher up in their brain, right? So just think about a pressure gradient. If there's high pressure everywhere and you put a release valve in that system lower down, um, the brain itself um, theoretically could herniate. Now, I don't think their literature has borne this out too much, um, but if you get a CT head um, on these patients and there's signs of increased intracranial pressure, cerebral edema, and all that kind of stuff, um, then technically you should not do a lumbar puncture. Um, another contraindication, which is a relative contraindication, is coagulopathy. Uh, patients with coagulopathy, for whatever reason, blood thinners, um, pathologic coagulopathies like DIC and such, um, or increased risk for epidermal hemat epidural hematomas, um, which can cause some serious problems and, you know, uh, going as far as cord compression if they persist long enough. Um, another thing, and these are kind of connected, is a uh, uh, cellulitis. 
So overlying cellulitis, one of the big complications is introduction of infection into the spinal canal. Um, and overlying cellulitis is an absolute contraindication because you don't want to poke a needle through an infection um, to then introduce that into the spinal cord and cause them to have uh, cephalitis, meningitis, or epidural abscess. Um, the last thing is hardware. Um, these patients shouldn't have bedside lumbar punctures. Um, it's not an absolute rule, but typically they should have a lumbar puncture under fluoroscopy so you can ensure um, that you're not damaging that hardware and you're going around it. Good, so we talked about the procedure itself, the indications, the contraindications. Um, now we deem a patient to have an appropriate indication, such as concern for central nervous system infection, subarachnoid hemorrhage, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, persistent altered mental status. We deem them not to have any contraindications, such as increased ICP, given that they had a negative head CT. Um, they do not have any hardware, they do not have any overlying cellulitis, and they're not coagulopathic. So we do the procedure. What are the possible complications? Um, so the biggest one, nah, I shouldn't say the biggest one, um, the one that is talked about the most, and it's one that we kind of already spoke on when talking about contraindications, is herniation. That's how you spell herniation, um, right? So like an uncle herniation, um, because we're decreasing that pressure gradient. Again, I don't think the literature really bears this out that strongly, um, but it is a very tested upon um, common thing that is spoken about. Another one is aorta and IVC perforation. So if we look over to our anatomy here, right, these are vertebral bodies. So directly in front of this, on both the left and right side, is going to be the aorta and IVC. So if you were to Superman poke this patient in the back, go through all of these layers, then through possibly an intervertebral disc and out the other side, um, you could poke into the aorta and IVC. Um, I you know, not to knock on wood, don't jinx it. I've never been a part of or heard of someone else being a part of that, uh, but it is a possible complication of this procedure. Uh, related to that is a retroperitoneal bleed. So if you injure a vascular structure, you know, in this area, the retroperitoneum is right there and you can get a retroperitoneal bleed. Retroperitoneal bleeds are really tough to diagnose. Um, you know, they're not going to be found on ultrasound with free fluid or anything. You'd have to do a CT imaging um, to really find them. Um, but something to keep in mind for these patients if they start to become anemic after the procedure. Um, we already talked about spinal cord puncture. So if you go too high, so you go above the level of the conus medullaris, which remember is this guy here. Um, you risk puncturing the spinal cord itself and damaging those nerves. Um, another one which we kind of already mentioned when we were talking about possible overlying cellulitis is, is introducing infection. Right? There's, you do not want to do a lumbar puncture, have it be negative for some of infection, and then have that patient two days later develop meningitis or encephalitis. Um, so sterilize, stay sterile, use good personal protective equipment. Um, and then pain which can be over LP site or headache. Um, the most common complication, right, is post LP headache. Um, that's why they have these patients lay supine for about an hour. Um, if they get a post LP headache, you can talk about caffeine, blood patches, and all that jazz. All right, so um, this is a lumbar puncture procedure. Uh, it's a very common procedure. Um, it's one that can be very, very easy until it isn't, right? You get a really skinny compliant patient um, whose anatomy you can see from the doorway. Uh, the lumbar puncture is, you know, no sweat, but you get a very obese patient who isn't compliant, isn't doing the appropriate positioning. Um, it can be a really tough procedure. Um, I didn't mention it here, but ultrasound is becoming a more mainstream way to properly identify anatomy um, for lumbar punctures, which uh, if people are interested, uh, let me know below and we can comment it on it a little bit more. Um, so thank you for watching. Again, check out some other videos, subscribe, ask some questions, let me know what other content y'all want to see, um, and I hope y'all have a great day.